A little while ago, Major Kill released a video talking about what he feels are the saddest moments in Warhammer, but in my opinion, I think he missed the actual saddest one. That being, the moment that First Captain Ezekiel Abaddon of the Sons of Horus wept. Oh my god, are you crying? Uh, no, it's just raining. <laughs> now, those of you who've been keeping up with the Siege of Terra are gonna immediately know what I'm talking about because no way this scene did not stick in your mind like a hot nail. Holy shit. But, for context, this scene comes in the book Saturnine by Dan Abnett, and it's honestly one of the best books in the Siege of Terra so far, because despite all the lore contradictions that are in it and the complaints some people have about it, this book is fucking immaculate. The way it all comes together at the end is just perfect. This is Dan Abnett at his best, and again, one of the single best books I have ever read. At this point in the siege, Rogel Dorn has realized that they don't have enough resources to hold every single wall of defense, and one of them is going to have to be allowed to fall. Each of these walls is effectively the size of a large city within a continent-sized fortress. That's one thing that needs to be remembered. So when I say Eternity Wall Spaceport or Lion's Gate Spaceport, you can effectively think of each of those as their own entire city in a continent-wide battlefield. And speaking of the Eternity Wall Spaceport, that is exactly where this book centers, because we see the preparations being made, and storylines being set up, and characters being introduced, all for them to come to a head when the Eternity Wall Spaceport is sacrificed by Rogel Dorn, knowingly sacrificed, in order to draw off forces that can be used to defend the rest of the wall. And furthermore, to reinforce a certain gap below the Saturnine Wall section that the traders would know about and could use as a shortcut to the Inner Palace, one that he deliberately didn't seal and filled with kill teams as a trap. Now the fall of eternity, watching these characters we've followed and grown attached to ever since the very beginning of the book, die off and be overwhelmed heroically one after another really means a lot. We lose characters like Kamba Diaz, Janisha Kroll, Olanius Piers, who we had only just met but it was really endearing, and not to mention characters like Joseph Barco Monday or Willem Cordy. We see these characters fighting against the inevitable knowing that they're pretty much dead. There is that hope in the back of your mind that some of them will get out, but deep down I think we all knew they were gonna die, and it's only confirmed when we hear their names reeled off. These characters we've been with since the start of the book by Janisha Kroll before she herself is cut down, lamenting that her story will never be told. And we know they're being sacrificed by Dorne, it's not some heroic battle against the inevitable, they're being sacrificed. And this is punctuated when Willem Cordy says to Joseph Barco Monday, the Praetorian won't let two gates fall in one day, right? That's why he sent the old man to us, he knows what he's doing. They believe that they might survive. This isn't that last stand on the hill where we're gonna go with glory. They're dying and they don't really know why. It's incredibly well written, but it isn't what's the saddest. The saddest part comes not at the Eternity Wall, but at the Saturnine Gap, from Abaddon as previously mentioned. Now what happens there? is Abaddon effectively tries to lead the Jesteren, the Terminator elite of the Sons of Horus, in a strike attack through this gap that he saw on Perturabo's map. However, they were ready and waiting, with strike teams led by the likes of Endred Har, Garvia Loken, Nathaniel Garrow, and others ready and waiting. Abaddon immediately knew he'd been played for a fool, not just by the Loyalists, but by Perturabo himself, who had effectively used him as bait, or as a scapegoat, to see if it would work, and if it didn't, pawn the blame off on Abaddon. So in this cramped area, Abaddon is raging as his Jesteren are killed, proclaiming how he's going to rip Forgebreaker out of Perturabo's hands and ram it down his throat and keep ramming until he splits in two, and how he's gonna kill every single tech addict because they're failing to teleport him out by some stupid error. He's gonna make everyone pay for this if he gets out of here alive. But it's not long before he accepts that he's not getting out of here alive. Now, we know that he does make it out, we know where this leads for him, but he doesn't know that, and in that moment, he comes to a sort of calm. And this is where it truly gets heartbreaking, because you have to understand his motivation for going on this daring attack wasn't just to win the war quickly before Gilliman gets here, no no no. It was because he sees his father, his beloved father Horus, who he would follow to hell and back, is deteriorating before his very eyes. 
He's barely lucid at times. He sits in his throne, his face drooping slack as he is enthralled by the powers of the warp. He's basically exhibiting signs of dementia where he forgets who he's talking to. He forgets who's who and what's where or what time it is or where he is or what he's doing. He continually mistakes his new equerry Argonis for his previous one Malakurst who is now dead and has been dead for a long time. Now, you have to remember Abaddon is a warrior. He's a peerless warrior and a gene wrought super soldier and a leader of men but he is still Horus's son first and foremost. And he blames the powers of chaos for what's happening to his father, which is why he wants to end this war as fast as possible with this risky, risky gambit. He knows it is incredibly dangerous and that it might not work at all, but he's willing to take it because the sooner this war ends, the sooner his father can go back to being himself. He convinces the other members of the Mornavile and Justerin of this, People like, you know, Kynor Argonis and Falcus Kyber and Horus Aximand. He's not doing this for the cause, he is doing this for his father. And he has had to take on more and more responsibility of leading the Legion. As Horus has been retreating into the warp to confront the Emperor and to consult with the Dark Powers, Abaddon has had to step up and basically lead the Legion. Sure, Perturabo is directing the siege, but Abaddon is the man on the ground. He has had to take on more and more responsibility onto himself, and had to sit there and bite his tongue as these dark powers that he despises and blames for the degradation of his father continue to worm their ways around him. But here, in this moment, in this fight to the death, where he is just a warrior, fighting with everything in him, regardless of anything or whatever's gonna happen, he finally is where he is meant to be, and he knows this. In the tenth minute, Abaddon arrived at a point of calm, of serenity, he accepted his onrushing death, which was surely only seconds away. It had become a game, a contest like the old practice cages. How many of them could he kill before he was bested? Some? Most? All? Some were fine warriors. Sepetus, he was magnificent. Har was a brute, but an interesting challenge. Garo. Abaddon fancied his own chances in an even match, but the man's sword was a piece of work, and so was Garo's skill with it. He realized as he killed, and killed, and killed, that he owed the Lord of Iron a genuine debt of gratitude. Abaddon was a warrior. He'd always been a warrior. It was his life, his purpose. He excelled at it. The warp was a distraction. It was just another weapon. Those who knelt before it, or pledged their worship, treated it like some kind of god, they were fools, all of them. Magnus, Lorgar, Fulgrim, fools. Horus was a fool. The warp was nothing. Being a warrior was everything. It defined him. The skill of combat, the lessons of defeat, the joy of triumph. That was his sacrament. Let them worship their false gods and giggling abominations. This was what he wanted. The chance to fight like a man, not a demon. The chance to take the palace and claim Terra the old fashioned way, by force of arms. He wanted to win as a warrior. Perturabo had let him try. He owed the Lord of Iron thanks for that. This was everything, he realized, as he entered the 11th minute, with almost everyone dead. This moment, its simplicity, skill and courage, tested to the limit for no other reason, to serve no grand plan or devious ruse, just tested for the sake of skill and courage. This moment was his life in its purest form, his life distilled. He fought Catachon and Imperial Fists and Black Shields and Cataphracti Terminators and Tactical Space Marines for no other principle than to find out who was best. There were no sides, no good or bad, no rebel cause or loyalist alliance, no war master, no emperor, no point to anything outside the broken, blood-smeared walls of the Killing Chamber. Just war. Only war. The binary test of the galaxy that you passed in triumph or failed in glory. Death. Rushing closer was immaterial. How many could he take? How many more times could he prove his prowess? He was Abaddon. Let them come. Let them all come. Find more and bring them too. Bring anyone, bring everyone. He would take them. Or he would die. Either way, it didn't matter anymore. Bell Sepetus blocked his descending blade. Sepetus, now a proper test. A dance of equals that carried them into the 13th and final minute of the fight. Their blades clashed and parried with such speed, it was joyful! The Blood Angel was amazing! The deftness of his skill, the precision of his strokes, the intensity of his address. 
Sepetus produced nuanced swordplay that Abaddon could barely turn back. There were skills here to learn, tricks to appreciate and copy, and the caravan's attack was absolute, a miraculous degree of murderous focus. Abaddon was sorry to kill him. His blade cut Sepetus in half. The Revan Hound slammed Abaddon into the wall, brick shattering. Abaddon fell, bones breaking and organs rupturing. Par was size and brute strength. There was no skill to speak of, just beautiful fury. Like one of Russ's pack dogs, or Angron's thug Karn. A wall of strength that crushed everything before it. The Black Shield had him by the throat. Par took six or seven of Abaddon's kill thrusts in the belly and chest and refused to die. Just refused. His strength seemed to grow as the blood wept out of him. Par's power fist was like a siege ram, hammering into Abaddon's head until his helmet broke and deformed and Abaddon's face was a mess of gore. One more like that. One more and it's done. The best example I can give, and it's one I've thought on a lot, is a child whose parent has succumbed to something like alcoholism or drug addiction or even a degenerative disorder like early onset Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. Because when that happens, the child, usually the eldest one, especially if they have younger siblings like Abaddon does, is going to have to take on the responsibilities of the parent, helping their younger siblings, helping maintain the house, helping cook, helping get groceries, basically do everything that you would expect a parent to do because the parent is now indisposed. This is exactly what we see with Abaddon. But that's not what children are meant to do. My family has money nowadays, we're very well off now, but we grew up in a very impoverished neighborhood and we still basically do live there despite our own means and the money we have. But I have seen kids basically in these exact situations where they're effectively robbed of their childhoods by having to maintain their house because of what has befallen their parent. Regardless of what you can say about the parent, the effects on the children just isn't good. There was an advertisement for the YMCA I saw on television once that ended with a line from the jingle of the commercial stating, I'm just too young to be old. And that's exactly what this is. Here, let me set the scene for you. Imagine someone whose parent is in this condition, maybe alcoholic or on drugs or that sort of thing, and they are basically the de facto parent now, but they themselves are still really young. Until they end up somewhere like a carnival, where they are who they're meant to be, a child. And you can see the language Abaddon uses in his internal monologue feels reminiscent of effectively a kid in a candy store or a kid at a carnival, where he's saying things like, bring anyone, bring everyone, find more and bring them too. That's like him saying, Oh, I'm gonna ride this ride, and that ride, and I'm gonna eat those sugary snacks, and this and that. Oh, all of it, all of it. Because he's just so sensorily overwhelmed. The language being used here, he says, Belsepetus' skill was joyful, he was sorry to kill him, his work was miraculous, and Har was this massive brute. And he's so enthralled in the moment. He is just so happy to be here. And he says, this is the truth of everything. The binary test of the galaxy, all these things he says make it clear that this is where he's meant to be and there is nowhere else in the entire galaxy where he would rather be. If Horus had literally phoned him and said, hey, I'm gonna teleport you in right now because I'm fighting the Emperor right now, come join me, he probably wouldn't wanna go because there's nowhere else he would rather be than here where he is truly the kid he was always meant to be. And if actually you've seen my Iron Warriors Virtue of Vengeance video, you know that I too missed out on a lot of what should be considered a proper childhood and was very miserable growing up. So I was so happy for Abaddon, watching him grow bitter and miserable and detached over the course of the siege and the heresy, seeing him so happy here meant so much to me. And then, when it ended. Oh boy. Now, there are times when I've been really sad reading a book or had a strong emotional reaction. This is the only time I had to pause the audiobook and get up and walk away from the screen. Because the reaction was that strong. I physically had to leave. It goes like this. Abaddon couldn't move. He could barely see. Endridhar's dead mass was slumped against him, crushing him against the wall. Abaddon tried to get free. There wasn't time. Garrow was back on his feet. That sword of his, gleaming. Garrow raised it. This was it then. One downward slash from a sword whose edge cut everything. This was it. 
Abaddon wanted it to never end. Ever. Ever. The end came, anyway. Har's enormous corpse shifted and fell away as the teleport flare faded. My lord, the Mechanicum Adept cried. My lord! They carried him to the arrestor seats and tried to peel the bloody visor from his helm without taking his face with it. All the other seats in the monolith's compartment were empty. We tried, Omega said. The grid. We had to reposition the termite to fire the grid again. It took time. I am sorry. Abaddon muttered something. What is he saying? The Magos asked. We are returning, one of the others told Abaddon eagerly. Full rate. The motivators are running. We are exiting the Fault Lord. Ahead of the enemy's attempt to seal it, the Medicaid will be waiting for you. Abaddon's mouth stirred again. My lord, the Magos asked, leaning into here. Let me go back, Abaddon whispered. He was weeping. Let me go back. You see, much like that kid at the carnival, finally being a kid after God knows how long, the end will come eventually. Soon, you're gonna hit closing time and, sorry kid, it's time for you to go back home. To that house, to those responsibilities, to everything you've been hiding from for these past few hours. And he doesn't want to go. On the way back home, he cries and cries and says, let me go back. It's not that he wants to go back to the carnival or back to the rides or the lights. It's back to that time. He wants to go back to when he was just a kid because he knows deep down that now that he has left, he's never going to get another chance to come back here again. It'll never be the same. This was the point in his life where his childhood basically said goodbye to him. And it's not coming back. That's what makes this so depressing. Especially since we, the audience, know where that child ends up. A shell of who he could have been. Someone truly great. Not nearly as bad as his parent, but certainly not great and certainly not anywhere close to who he could have been if he had been allowed to grow up properly. Abaddon knows that he's probably never going to get another chance like this again. After this, it's back to the demons, back to the siege, back to being Horus's lapdog and watching him deteriorate. And we can see this throughout the rest of the siege, where he is just so detached and disaffected with everything and is basically just going through the motions with the rest of it. He doesn't care anymore. And he himself is now enthralled to those ruinous powers as the leader of the Black Legion, the new enemy of the Imperium. Yes, he has absolutely learned from the mistakes of Horus Lupercal, but is he really that much better than him? Not really, and that's what makes it so sad. And even if you can't personally relate to this, part of the reason it's so sad is because this is basically tailor-made to get you to feel bad. I saw a video talking about how to make your audience cry in writing, and the number one way that they listed in it was injustice. Not just a bad thing happening to somebody, but something that is flatly unfair. Like, bad things happen to people, but that's oftentimes maybe the result of their actions or the logical endpoint of their story. Like that one Night Lord who was possessed by a demon crashing his ship to take the demon with him like Major Kill said, or Malkador sitting on the throne making that sacrifice, or even that one guardsman saying, yes, I did find her in Hell's Reach. Malkador knows he's making this sacrifice and he's prepared to do so. It's the logical end to his character. And that Night Lord, it was a moment of triumph for him. It really was. And again, the logical, satisfying end to his character arc. And with the soldier, that's what happens in war. You're gonna lose people you love, and it is tragic. But it doesn't have that true feeling of emotional injustice that this moment with Abaddon carries. We have followed him throughout the entire heresy and just seen him grow more and more dejected. But he was loyal. Well, you know, loyal in air quotes. He was a traitor, yes, and he did result in the deaths of a lot of people we liked, and he was out to kill Garvio Loken, but he was loyal to Horus no matter what. He even sat by and bit his tongue when all this chaos crap was coming about, even though he hated it, because he was loyal to Horus. And to see all of that repaid with this, to see him brought so low that he begins weeping, the ultimate badass in the galaxy is weeping from the pain and the sorrow, is just so unfair. He has been brought down so much, and he doesn't deserve it. It's not what Abaddon deserves, and that's what makes this probably the saddest moment in all of Warhammer. But what do you guys think? Do you think this is the saddest moment in Warhammer? Or do you think something else tops it? I would genuinely love to hear what you guys have to say on that, because I haven't read all of Warhammer. And 
Do you think I'm just wrong? Like, do you think, you know, fuck Abaddon, he gets what he deserves? Like, were you completely unmoved by this? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below, and until then, I will see you in the next video.